In the previous part, we saw how to solve a least squares linear regression problem. And we saw why the squared loss is kind of a convenient loss because of the fact that it's convex, uh, which is very nice and leads to a closed form solution here. But where, where did it come from and why is this justified? Why is this like kind of a right thing to do? Well, we're going to see why it can be the right thing to do via a perspective known as maximum likelihood estimation or MLE. Before we uh, do that, let me just quickly recall what a Gaussian distribution is. This should be recap for all of you, but uh, a Gaussian distribution is a distribution with n, uh, with mean mu uh, and variance, say, sigma squared. And a Gaussian looks roughly something like the following. The probability distribution, where you can see it has a lot of uh, mass, at least in 1D, around the mean, and roughly speaking, this is kind of like the width of the distribution. This is on the uh, order of like sigma. I'm being very vague here, um, what I mean by this, but uh, this is the picture of what a Gaussian looks like. And it has the following PDF. Uh, the probability density function is f of x is equal to one over square root two pi sigma squared times x minus x minus mu squared all over two sigma squared. Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, but once you see it enough, then it's just very natural to you. Um, so this is a univariate Gaussian distribution. Uh, there's also notions of multivariate Gaussians, which maybe we'll write it down, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of similar in some sense, just the same thing in multiple dimensions. That's a Gaussian distribution. It's nice, it's convenient for a number of mathematical reasons, and we're going to use it in this course, so get used to it. Okay, so that's just a small diversion, which will be helpful for setting up the explanation of why the squared loss arises via maximum likelihood estimation. So maximum likelihood estimation essentially gives you an idea of how to estimate some parameters. The principle here in maximum likelihood estimation is that you pick the parameters, which if you had these parameters, they result in the highest probability of the data coming up. So to state it another way, this is kind of the optimization problem that we are trying to solve, argmax over model parameters, which maximizes the following uh, probability of the observed data. Given the model params. Yeah, that's the whole principle. And we're going to see that if you apply maximum likelihood estimation to the proper, to, to the, just the right type of setting, uh, then uh, for linear regression, then uh, it leads to the least, uh, to squared error type setting. That, and that gives you the optimal maximum likelihood estimation answer. Okay, so in order to do that, we're going to have to make some sort of assumption over how our data is generated. So our assumption will be the following. Our x's, they can be generated however. We don't really care what, uh, how, how the x's are generated. But the y's are going to be determined based on the x's as follows. We're going to say that yi, the label of a point, or the, the, the value of a point, is going to be equal to the inner product of the sum parameter vector, which is unknown, but it's fixed, times the feature vector, plus z, where z is some random, uh, let's say z i, where z is i is going to be distributed as a Gaussian with zero mean and sigma squared variance. Yeah, so the idea is that there actually exists some optimal w, which is used for generating the y's, uh, but, and, but the thing is that our readings are corrupted by some Gaussian noise. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that the maximum likelihood uh, the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameter vector w given a set of data which is generated according to this sort of model, that will result in the least squared, uh, least squared solution. So we'll prove this right now, right here. Okay, like we said, we're going to set our w hat to be equal to argmax over w of that maximize the probability of seeing the data set we saw, x1 through xn given w, whatever w is. Okay, so now the first thing we're going to do is use the fact that our points 
our data points were generated iid this is kind of uh, as we mentioned before a common assumption and so if you have independent uh, samples then it's just going to be the product of those uh, probabilities so the probability of x uh, i y i coming up given some w well now let's just uh, expand this using Bayes rule really the the idea of the next step here is the fact that uh, our x's like we said we don't really care how they're distributed and they in particular they don't depend on the w they can't really depend on the w so this can be written equivalently as probability of uh, kind of using Bayes rule this is y i given x i and w if you're not familiar with Bayes rule this is something you should uh, know I'm not going to review it here so please look it up if you're not familiar uh, times probability of x i addition on w I guess this isn't even Bayes rule this is just like the law of total probability maybe uh, I, I don't know what the actual name for it is, but it's one of these standard things. So the argmax, uh, then as we said, this is kind of going to be, this is something that we can just drop because of the fact that uh, those are kind of independent. It doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't determine Sorry, this product is independent of whatever the value of w is because the xi's don't depend on the w's. So therefore, there's just going to be a constant factor and choosing a different w will not change this value. So we can just ignore it because we're only looking for uh, something which maximizes it, not the actual value. Okay, so now from here, we're going to do a common trick, which is known as, well, I don't know if there's a name for it, but essentially the fact that uh, the logarithm is a uh, monotone function. So whatever maximizes this is going to also maximize the following. And the reason we do this is because the log has a very nice property, which means we can just uh, change this product. We can pull this product out and turn it into a summation. over the points. And so this is very convenient, of course, uh, because sums are nicer than products, in my opinion. But OK, we're actually surprisingly close to getting there. Maybe you can see now this is going to be the sum over some sort of function applied to each point. So this is pretty nice. Um, and how are we going to do this now? We note the fact that this distribution here, uh, the distribution of yi, according to if we're given the xi's and the w's well since we know uh it's essentially going to be a gaussian with mean at the inner product of w and xi and variance equal to sigma squared because uh yeah it's just adding a gaussian to a constant so therefore it's going to be a gaussian with the constant being the mean and the same variance so just to write that this term here or sorry the distribution of let me just write this here the distribution of yi given xi comma w this is going to be distributed as a gaussian with mean equal to inner product of w comma xi and variance sigma squared cool so based on that and based on the fact that we know what the gaussian pdf looks like uh, we can just uh, substitute that in here we can compute the log of the pdf So this just gives us summation of uh, subbing in the PDF. We have log of one over square root two pi sigma squared plus log of the other term, which is exp. So these are going to cancel out, uh, you can see, of minus yi minus uh, w comma. I squared two sigma squared and now what we're going to do is we're going to simplify this what we're going to do is just ignore this because you can see this doesn't depend on w so this th these terms can be ignored and we're going to uh, 
cancel out these log and this x, which will just leave us with this remaining term. So simplifying this, this gives us arg max over w uh, minus summation. Let, let me pull some of this out. 1 over 2 sigma squared. And we're almost done. All we're going to do is, uh, first of all, we can drop this, because again, it's going to just be a constant multiplying uh, in front, which uh, is not going to change the arg max. So we can sort of just get rid of this. And since we have a uh, negative here, we can change this max to a min. So this just becomes arg min over w of summation yi minus the inner product of w and xi squared. And that there it is, right? This is exactly the type of loss function we were looking at before, basically the sum of the squared errors. And that's it. That's the proof showing that if you wanted to do maximum likelihood estimation, where you know your data is coming from a model that looks like this, then uh, the solution is the following, uh, the least squared solution. So that's why it kind of is very principled in the setting where you know your data comes according to this model, but we still use it in other situations as well. Cool. So that's one way to derive the squared loss in a particular setting. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, when maybe is the least square solution, not the right solution. And this is, brings us to something called regularization. Let me try to give you an example of why regularization is a reasonable thing to do. And uh, then we can talk about some more specific technical things. So first, I'm going to give you a picture of why it makes sense. So let me draw a caricature. So I'm not going to use linear regression here as an example of why it makes sense, just because I think it illustrates the clearest. Um, it, it, it may illustrate it clearer to use, say, polynomial regression. So the caricature, imagine our data set is something like this. And we want to fit some sort of uh, function to this. We want to fit it. And you might be thinking, okay, we've been working in linear regression. So why, not we just, uh, why don't we just say, like, okay, fit a, fit a line to it and it'll look something like this, right? Uh, that's a great solution for linear regression. Seems pretty right. But however, suppose we don't really know that it's going to be a linear function a priori. So instead, what we do is we just say, OK, maybe it's a linear function. Maybe it's a cubic function. Maybe it's a degree 10 function. But just find the best polynomial that fits this data. So if you just say, try to find me the best polynomial that fits this data, then you're going to get something that looks like this. It's probably something that looks like this, and then you know maybe interpolates like this, and then you have some funny function which looks like this, this, and like this. Uh, maybe that goes backwards. But the point is, it's going to give you, if you just say, give me some polynomial that fits the data, it's going to give you something like this. And while this might be great for the training data, it's going to get zero loss because it fitted very well, uh, it's not going to generalize well. The idea is overfit to the data. Say this point will give a significant non-zero error, whereas, you know, Instead, what we might have thought is better is actually the squared, uh, uh, this uh, linear solution here. So the idea here is somehow we want our answers in many cases to be simple. We want to enforce some simplicity in the solution. If, uh, if we just allow our classifier to be, or sorry, our learning function to be arbitrarily complicated, then it might overfit the data, which is bad. So we're going to try to enforce some sort of simplicity in our solution, and that will uh, give us uh, that will be known as regularization, and might lead to it shouldn't generally lead to answers which exhibit better generalization. That is, uh, it gives a good answer on new data set, not just the training data. Cool. So that's like the intuition behind what regularization will be. Uh, agreed that this is kind of like a different setting from what we're looking at, but I'll give you one a little bit more mathematical uh, example as to where uh as to a setting in which uh regularization is important because of things like numerical stability so okay let's let's let me give you one example suppose our uh data was something like this we have x1 is equal to 0 comma 1 
and y1 is equal to 1. And then we had another point, x2 is equal to epsilon, where epsilon is going to be some small value in 1, and y2 uh, is equal to minus 1. Now, my claim is that you can work this out on your own by like, just trying to solve the things before. But so the idea is that these are very, very close points to each other, but uh, they're labeled opposite things. And so the uh, claim is that the least square solution to this, w hat, will be equal to minus 2 over epsilon uh, and 1. So the idea is that this is a very sensitive solution in the sense that uh, if we set this to be 0, then it'll give us uh, something with an infinite slope. Uh, if we set it to be something like a little bit slightly bigger than 0, then it'll give us a very large slope. But the point is that the solution can vary drastically depending on what the value of epsilon is. So this is kind of very uh, a very sensitive thing. Uh, it, what's the way to say this? The solution is very sensitive, even though we picture that the line that you output in both of, in any of these cases should be very similar. So this is kind of a, especially in the case where maybe you're running into numerical precision issues, and uh, this epsilon is really something which maybe you can't even re represent very accurately uh, on a computer. So this kind of gives one example as to where just a small example changing a training point just a little bit can result in a very different answer. And that's something we'd rather avoid. And that's something, this is another motivation, which is kind of different from the one I mentioned here in terms of why we want regularization. But in general, it's to try to avoid depending too much on one point and uh, being very sensitive to things like that. So okay, there's a few different ways of uh, doing regularization. And one way of doing regularization, the common thing, is by adding on an, an L2 loss in terms of the parameters. So this is called something called uh, Tikhonov uh, regularization, or otherwise is known as ridge regression, e either one. These are sort of interchangeable uh, names. And the idea is the following. In so this is a classic squared loss we'd looked at, look at. Uh, we'd minimize a w minus z in L2 norm squared. Well, now what we do uh, is we also have some, this is the regularization term as we called it, uh, something which penalizes essentially large values of w. So this says, okay, we, we have, we try to optimize the solution, but simultaneously we try to make sure our solution is fairly close to the origin, it's not too big. And this is going to be what's known as a hyperparameter, meaning that, uh, this is not something given, this is something the algorithm designer, the, the, uh, the learner has to set. So we as, we as a person running this type of ridge regression algorithm would choose what sort of lambda we want. And this would be kind of, uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how to choose this in a second. But yeah, uh, roughly speaking, this kind of tries to do some sort of balancing act. One is, uh, it balances two things. One is kind of the loss in terms of how well we fit the data. And the other thing is how simple our solution is. So this says kind of we want to give good error and this will uh, give small error on the training set. And this says uh, our solution should be simple. So just going back to our picture that we drew before here, this like uh, visualization, you can see that the first solution, which sort of fits in things, has zero error here. But it would have probably a much larger hyper or, or much larger L2 norm of the parameter vector just because it's very complicated. Whereas this type of solution, the straight line, would have somewhat larger uh, solution here, but this would be much smaller. So it would do a better balancing act between these two parameters, or between these two terms, rather. Cool. So this somehow uh, prefers smaller parameters, uh, smaller yeah, parameter vector solutions. So this is nice and common and very, very commonly used as a type of regularization. And uh, it's nice because it's closed form solvable, similar to uh, uh, just standard least squares regression. Now there's another type of uh, regression, which is known as the lasso, uh, which is somewhat similar in the sense it's still regularized uh, least squares. 
But this time we do a different thing. So first of all, there's a lambda. This might be a different lambda. So it's still a hyperparameter, but it's just some sort of thing that the algorithm sets again. But this time we do L1 penalization. So this is a different type of penalization. These are different norms of the vector, but they, they might seem similar to you, but they actually result in very qualitatively different solutions uh, in the sense that lasso is very common tool uh, in the setting where we're trying to look for a parameter vector w, which is very sparse. And by sparse, I mean something where uh, the entries are uh, almost all zero, essentially. We want many of the entries to be zero. And this is the case where maybe we just have a lot of features in our feature vectors, and maybe a lot of them don't really matter. A lot of them might be irrelevant, but we don't care. We just throw them in and lasso will find a solution which kind of realize that, okay, many of your uh, answers might be, uh, many of your features might be irrelevant, so we can just put zeros in there and that's uh, kind of preferred by lasso. Uh, so yeah, this is, this, uh, let, let me say this also, this is not necessarily not closed form solvable because it's not as convenient as before. It's not, it's, it's a different norm, which is typically harder to uh, solve for or for, to optimize with, uh, but, yeah, so these are two different forms of regularization, which kind of give different types of solutions, shrinking down the uh, solution vector in some way, but in different ways between the two of them. Okay, and the last thing that we're going to talk about today is what's known as uh, hyperparameter selection and uh, cross-validation. So yeah, the, as the thing that I didn't tell you how to do here is how do you choose this lambda? Uh, if you know your data very well, then maybe you'd already know that, okay, maybe I want to penalize it like by putting a lambda equals 0 0.01 here, but I don't know. I, I don't know how to do that off the top of my head. Uh, maybe if you're an expert data scientist, you'll just have this type of intuition after a while. But a more reasonable thing to do is try a bunch of different hyperparameters uh, and see which one works. But you have to do this very carefully. So let, let's talk a little bit more about how to choose hyperparameters and how to do validation and cross-validation. So let's take a step back. There's typically three, when, when we're doing any sort of machine learning task, there's a few different types of data sets. So there's going to be the training data set, which is the uh, data set, uh, the data set which is given to us to come up with some sort of classifier or some sort of regression solution, some sort of parameter vector. But we come up with some solution based on the training data set. And the accuracy of this, this is measured with respect to the test data set. So typically, uh, what you what you do is you look at the training data set, you do a lot of hard thinking, and eventually you commit saying, okay, this is what my parameter vector is going to be, and let's see how well we did on the test data set, and then you can see how good it is. That's kind of the right way to do it. Let me tell you the wrong way to do it. The wrong way to use your training in your test data set is you start with your training data set, and you come up with something, and then you try it on the test data set, and it's total garbage. It doesn't work at all. Uh, so you think, okay, uh, something went wrong. Let's go back to the training data set. Let's make some changes. Let's do some other tweaks. And that does a little bit better on the test data set. Uh, and then what you do is you uh, keep going and you keep going. And eventually you come up with some solution, which gets like 99.99% solution on the test data set. And all right, we found a solution, right? But the reason why that's bad is because typically that means uh, in, in many cases, it's very easy to overfit to the test data set, meaning you've got something which uh, did well on the test data set, but if you just got even one more, if you got another new data set, a new, a, a new testing data set, then it would perform very poorly on that. So the idea is you can't really go back and forth with your test data set or even look at it before you commit to something. Otherwise, you're going to potentially overfit and not really have a good, uh, a, a good um, solution. So instead, a common thing to do is maybe work with a validation set, what's known as a validation set. And the idea here is that you can kind of test things out on your validation set, but not too much. So let me, let me say, like, again, the right way to do this and the wrong way to do this, perhaps. The, let me tell you the wrong way to do this. The wrong way is just to do what I just said before, where you start with your training data set. And then you come up with something and you see how well it does on the validation data set. And then, okay, it didn't do so well. So you go back to your training data set, go do better. And then you get something better on the validation and you so on, so on until you get something very good on the validation data set. Now, the thing is, once you've got this thing which you've committed to and you think this is great and you take it to the test data set, 
it'll probably be pretty bad again. And the reason is because you've overfit to your validation data set. That's something you don't want to do uh, because it won't generalize well. So instead, the correct way to use your validation data set is to, first of all, commit to a bunch of different hyperparameter settings in your, when you're doing training. So for example, remember we're trying to pick this lambda value and we don't know what uh, lambda should be. So maybe we'll say lambda equals 0 0.01 and then lambda equals 0 0.1 and lambda equals 0 0.5 and one. These are our different candidates for what our uh, hyperparameter lambda would be. What we do is we train the training data set uh, and generate four different uh, models, one with each of these different uh, lambda hyperparameters. And what we do then is pick from those four different uh, models using the validation data set to see which one gave the best uh, accuracy on the validation data set. And whichever one did best there, then we use that, uh, that's our final solution. And we use that for the test data set. So you can, what you can do is you can kind of specify a few different hyperparameter selections and use your validation data set non-adaptively, meaning before you ever touch your validation data set, you commit to the types of hyperparameters you're going to pick and uh, see how well they do. Uh, you can't really go back and forth in an adaptive fashion unless you use some really advanced tools, which are currently in perhaps a more theoretical state uh, based on things like differential privacy and something called adaptive data analysis. But yeah, really, you can't go back and forth with your validation. You have to commit before and then see how things do. So yeah, your validation data set is used to see how well things generalize from your training data set and pick something for the test. Now, the thing is, sometimes you might be in settings where your validation uh, data set is either very small or non-existent. Perhaps you just don't have enough data and you don't want to waste it by splitting your, tra your training data set into training and validation. Instead, what you do is you just have only your training. Now, are you totally out of luck? And fortunately, the answer is no, because there's still something useful you can do with your uh, data, which is called k-fold cross-validation. And this essentially says that we're going to uh, split our training data set into different parts and use it for doing validation and training itself. So let's suppose we have our, uh, let, let's, let me try to illustrate what cross-validation is. So cross-validation, we have some sort of training data set. And what we do is we first split this into k different pieces. one, two, dot, 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 all the way over up to n, or sorry, k, where, remember, this is of size n, there's n points in the training set, so each of these might be of size n over k, where we typically choose k to be maybe a small constant, something like 5, k equals 10, something like that might be reasonable to use as a parameter for cross-validation. Now, uh, what you do is essentially you, you're going to kind of measure the how good a particular hyperparameter choice is based on uh, kind of some sort of leave one out thing. So let, let, let me try to be a bit more precise. What you're going to do is for each, say, lambda that you want to try, or where lambda is whatever hyperparameter, is not uh, specific to this linear or regularized regression problem, what you're going to do is you're going to essentially train it on, you're going to train it k different times, each time leaving out one of these different things. and seeing how well it does on the remainder. So what you do, let me try to be a bit more precise. So for each of these, what you're going to do is for i equal one to k, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, measure, you're going to, sorry, let me train, we'll say w lambda i, is going to be equal to, uh, you know, you train on like, let, let me write this as uh, d1, two, all the way up to three dk, train on d, let, let's say the union of d uh, j for j, equals one to k except j does not equal i 
So, okay, this is a bit mathematical, but let me just try to say what I'm trying to say here. Essentially, is you, you leave one out. So the, when i equals 1, you train it on all of these, but you don't train it on this one. Uh, and then what you do is you measure performance. You let perf, perf of uh, lambda comma i equal be equal to like the um, sort of the some any sort of uh, accuracy of w lambda i on the sort of held out one so d i. So you use all of these as the training data and then you test on this fraction of the data which you left out. And then similarly you do that with d2. You train it on all of the things and then you uh, except for d2 and then you test on that and then you get some sort of measure of accuracy. And then all you do is you measure the overall performance of some lambda, which is equal to the sum of a perf of lambda comma i, uh, where i equals one to k. And then you return the argmax of perf lambda. Where this argmax is taken over lambda, so it's a very intuitive concept where essentially you uh, you you measure how okay. I don't think this part is super intuitive in the sense that you just basically leave one out and you see how good it does when you train on everything else and you test on that one and then you repeat that and sum it over all different uh, uh, leave one out options and then you sum up the performance over all of those and then you just do the best you output the one which did the best overall. By just uh, which has the best sum of uh, accuracies in some sense. This might be accuracy. This could be some other metric that we're using to measure how good something is. And yeah, that's how we kind of do uh, cross validation. So yeah, we saw using a validation set and using a cross val how to do cross validation. There's one last thing I'm going to comment on, which is a sort of important point. It might seem like uh, minor, but it's kind of important in terms of how we. Uh, do this measure this uh, validation uh, error and how we do uh, how we measure test error so when we're training if we're doing regularization what we do is recall we do like uh, something like a w minus z plus lambda times w say something like this for ridge regression so this is what we use during training time but what we use at test time or for validation is we, we, we don't use this essentially because what we're really trying to do, what we're trying to optimize overall is we're really trying to optimize the squared error. Uh, so, but the thing is we do, do this when we're training in order to prefer things that would have good generalization. So yeah, this is an important, a minor, perhaps minor, but an important point where you essentially don't include regularization typically when you do the testing, measuring testing error or validation. That's because this is truly what we care about. Recall this is our goal. This just helps us get there better. Cool. And so that concludes everything. Uh, I know we had a lot of coverage uh, in this lecture, but hyperparameters, uh, regularization, squared loss, and all that. Um, and that's kind of linear regression for you.